our business leaders are here today to help offer advice and guidance on the reopening of office buildings. Per Governor Abbott's order last week, office buildings may reopen with limited operations on May 18th. Both the governor, county judge, and mayor have encouraged those that can to continue to work from home. We understand that that is not possible for all businesses. So today we'll cover what employers need to know, best practices, and how to keep employee safety top of mind for those reopening their office space. This is the first of a series of webinars we will host to learn from each other and share how each of us is adapting along the way towards transitioning from work from home to working in your office space. I would like to thank our sponsors for supporting the Chamber programming. Amazon, Ascension Seton, PIMCO, and Wells Fargo are our exclusive pivotal partners. And thank you to our foundation partners. And thank you to our corporate partners. Our business workshop is designed to provide great tips and insight, plus give the audience an opportunity to ask the panel anything. Please note, this will be recorded and posted on our website. Here with us today is Kristen Markham, who will moderate our panel. Kristen is the president of Elizabeth Christian Public Relations and works with a diverse roster of clients, including Austin-based St. David's Healthcare and Texas Mutual Insurance Company. In 2017, she led the communication campaign to bring Major League Soccer to Austin. Kristen is a graduate of Leadership Austin and a member of the Austin Area Research Organization. She serves the following organizations as a member of the board of directors, the Austin Chamber of Commerce, thank you, Kristen, Ballet Austin, United Way for Greater Austin, and the Austin Ed Fund in support of Austin ISD. In 2018, the Austin Chamber of Commerce named Kristen a Volunteer of the Year, and in 2019, she was named a finalist in the Austin Business Journal's Profiles and Power Awards. Please welcome Kristen Markham. Thanks so much, Dana, and good morning, everybody. You are right, it is certainly uh, an uncertain time, um, but here's what I'm certain of. People have a lot of questions about returning to the office. When we promoted this webinar with just a few days notice, we were concerned that we may not have enough interest. But um, judging by the hundreds of you who've signed up today, um, I think there is a lot of interest in this topic. And fortunately, we've got a roster of panelists today with deep expertise in this arena. So I hope that um, we can begin to clear up some of the uncertainty for you. Um, joining us today, we have Tim Hendricks, and he will bring, bring to you the perspective of a property owner. Uh, Tim is the Senior Vice President and Managing Director of Cousins Properties. He has more than 30 years of experience, and he's responsible for Cousins acquisitions, development, leasing, and marketing activities in Central Texas. Um, he's had a huge influence on the Austin Central Business District um, with projects such as uh, Frostbank Tower, Colorado Tower. He's also led the development on several award-winning suburban projects throughout Austin, namely Motorola's Palmer Lane Campus, Palisades West, and The Domain. He serves on the board of Opportunity Austin. So uh, he's a great person to have on our panel. Thank you so much for making time today, Tim. Joining Tim, we have Pam Madair. Pam is going to speak to us about the liability perspective of return to office. Pam is a partner in Jackson Walker's real estate and land use section. She represents clients before state and local governments. A significant portion of her practice involves representing owners and developments of real estate property and land use and governmental issues. Pam has served as an adjunct professor, professor at UT School of Law, where she's assisted with teaching courses on negotiation. Uh, she currently serves as director and formerly general counsel of the Greater Austin Chamber. So thank you for your service, Pam. Uh, she's past chair of the Real Estate Council of Austin, past president of the Central Texas Commercial Association of Realtors, and immediate past president of the Texas Association of Defense Council. Thank you for making time today, Pam. Um, Rick Whiteley is the executive director of Cushman and Wakefield and he will be bringing us the perspective of a tenant rep. He has more than 40 years of experience in Austin's commercial real estate market, and for over 20 years, he's represented landlords in all facets of the office building sector, including development, 
finance, leasing, property management, construction management. In 2001, he began exclusively representing tenants and occupiers, and he's provided clients in Austin ranging from Fortune 50 companies to prominent local firms with the highest level of real estate service and value available in the marketplace. Like our other uh, panelists, he has many accomplishments throughout his career. He's been named the Austin Chamber of Commerce's Volunteer of the Year twice, and multiple years, he's been named top commercial real estate heavy hitter in the ABJ. So I feel like the chamber really knocked it out of the park today, bringing you some of the best in the business to answer some tough questions. So here's what we've got planned for you today. Thank you all for making time to sign up. Um, I think it's going to be a rich discussion. First, our panelists are going to share maybe eight, 10 minutes of expertise from their arena on the subject of return to office. And we're being very intentional about calling it return to office, not return to work. We know your employees, many of them have been working at home, but now we're looking at that transition to an office space, possibly. So they'll speak to you, and then we'll open it up to your questions. We'd love this to be um, a dialogue, just like we're sitting in a room together. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Tim. And again, Tim is going to speak to us from the perspective of a property owner. Tim. All right. Uh, thank you, Kristen, and good morning to everybody. Uh, first of all, I look forward to seeing everybody back in the buildings and back on the streets again. Uh, Cousins, as an essential business, we have been in operations mode, um, I guess, by ourselves for the last nine weeks. Uh, so we're looking forward to having our customers and friends back, back with us again. Uh, I'm going to keep this pretty brief because I really do look forward to, to hearing everybody's questions. Um, if we roll it back to March 1st when this episode in our, our lives started, Cousins immediately folded down and established um, our Cousins uh, COVID-19 task force led by senior executives within our organization to start planning for what do we do for our customers when they do come back. Uh, we utilized information from the CDC, the World Health Organization, IRM, BOMA. Uh, we studied all the federal orders uh, as well as the state executive orders. Started compiling that information as a baseline to start trying to figure out how, how are we going to move forward and continue to provide a high level of service to our customers. Next thing is we, we need to communicate with our customers. So we reached out to 2,500 of our customers in about 20 million square feet and asked questions. What, what's on their mind? Um, it allows us to start trying to study and respond to our, to our many customers. And we have customers ranging from Fortune 10, 350,000 square foot um, utilizers of, of office space down to 800 square feet. So you can imagine the, the, the wide range of, of questions. Um, then we started working with our individual regional um, property management teams um, because as, as we've heard, and it's, it truly is factual, uh, one size is not going to fit all and we've got to be very nimble. Uh, we've We've completed that process. We've started the, the informal communications to our customers. A couple of things we will continue to do. Um, there's, there's just not as much data as we'd like on our HVAC system. Seems to be one of the key elements that our customers are most interested in. So we will continue to study our industry uh, data on the HVAC systems. Uh, we have uh, purchased and distributed uh, PPE to all of our staff members as well as security members. Uh, we work with our janitorial teams and then the rest of our vendors to make sure that they're going to keep their employees safe. Um, and then we've pushed everything down to the regionals. That's where, that's really where the, the rubber meets the road. Um, we have purchased uh, electratic, electronic static sprayers uh, for each of the buildings. Um, those will be used to clean the common areas as well as the high touch areas. Um, the next step was communications, and, and this is key for all of us. Um, our, we want to make sure our customers are communicating with us and vice versa. Uh, so we put together really seven key elements as, as we look to go forward 
um, and welcoming everybody back into the Cousins uh, buildings. Uh, first is communication. Uh, we're gonna try and try and try to make sure that we're answering everybody's question and, and providing them with as much data as we have. Um, signage, uh, I, I, I never thought I would see so much signage on so many surfaces in an office building, but we've, we've flooded our buildings with signage um, and um, you'll see some of those here in a few minutes. Um, cleaning, uh, we'll continue to work with our janitorial teams as well as our own personal staff. Uh, the cleaning will be extensive. It's been extensive uh, while everybody's been away, um, but it'll continue to be as we move through. Uh, elevator use, uh, man, this one's been a really tough one. Now, you load these buildings predominantly in about a 90 minute window in the morning and you unload it about 90 minute window in the afternoon typically. We've looked at industry uh, standards. You know, the Cushman Wakefield folks published a great report that Rick will talk about that really gave us a lot of great guidelines. And so we've established a two to four person um, maximum occupancy. We're not gonna have security guards standing there whacking you with a ruler if, if, you, if you don't do it. Uh, but we do believe that our customers are very responsible, and uh, so we, we think the system will work. Um, air quality, we've already uh, changed out all our air filters. We will continue to do that. We're cleaning all the coils, um, and there's not a lot of data um, out there to talk about will the virus actually you know, attach itself to filters, but we'll continue to study that. Um, and, and adjust as needed. Um, common areas and amenities, this is another area that our customers are very, very vocal about. Um, the key here is to make sure that we follow the CDC guidelines. Um, we've been hearing it to the point of nauseam, but they really are very, very beneficial and will keep us all safe. Um, so we've got uh, placards, and um, signage throughout every one of our buildings that talk about how to how to work and interact with each other in common areas. Um, our amenities, most of our buildings have um, conference facilities as well as fitness centers. <clears throat> we will not be opening these up for the foreseeable future. Um, we'll see, you know, how we work through phase one, two, and then three. Um, per the uh, government's uh, Open America Back Up standards, um, and we'll see how we how we do with those. Um, and then, last but not least, is access and visitors. Um, our buildings will continue to be um, accessed only by uh, card key. Uh, so, if you're a customer of the building, an employee of, of one of our customers, you'll have access to the building. You'll have to arrange for visitors. Um, to enter the building and uh, you'll escort your visitors up into your space. We're asking our customers for the immediate time to try to restrict visitors. Um, we've gone as far as, as asking people to, to limit um, at, uh, meetings in their space. Most of our customers are, are uh, uh, following that procedure. And I, I think just to give us a little bit of a runway, um, if, if we can limit that, that's going to go a long way to get us down this road. Um, in the Austin region, um, I, I am blessed to have some of the, the best professionals uh, in this business, uh, led by uh, Heather, Haney, uh, Heather Haney, our Director of Property Management. Uh, these folks have been on the ground 24-7 since this started. Uh, they've been doing proactive activities in the buildings and then working with our task force on how we bring this from the corporate level down and, and actually put it in the field. Um, we surveyed our Austin uh, customers, which uh, represents about 185 uh, different companies. We asked them a couple of simple questions. Now, how many employees do you have? How many employees are you going to be bringing back? And how is that going to uh, be staged. It's interesting, we've got a wide range of responses. Um, we do think that the majority of our customers will be phasing in in some kind of staggered process. 
that will start probably in earnest um, uh, on Monday, um, and then we'll kind of filter in through the rest of the summer. So as the earliest is uh, uh, May 18th, and then so far the, the latest uh, customer response has been September 1. Um, our customers have been really, really great to work with. Um, they have lots of different concerns, and our job is to try to be proactive and respond to them as fast as possible. Um, I, we did in our survey ask a few questions of our customers, which I kind of pulled out a few of them um, that may be uh, re you know, representative of, of maybe some things that are on y'all's mind. Um, you know, one of the questions, you know, how are we going to control social distancing in the common areas? Um, we, we really can't, uh, but, but we can supply signage. And um, I think the majority of that will be controlled really by peer pressure. Um, and as we've traveled around the city of Austin, Austin's done really well um, at social distancing, I believe. Elevator occupancy, I've, I've dealt with that. We may go as far as actually putting footsteps in the four corners of the elevators to help people get used to that. Um, visual um, representations is, is something I think we all react to, and it's a good reminder. Um, are we gonna require our customers to wear PPE? No, we're not. But we are gonna ask um, our customers to wear masks when they're in common areas. Um, our staff, and our security personnel and our vendors will be doing it. Um, and we, we think that by, by leading by example, it will spread through. And maybe we'll have a little fun with it. Uh, we can have a mask contest or, or try to make this, make this a little bit lighter. Um, enhanced cleaning. Um, boy, this is, is a, a very complicated um, issue. But what we are gonna do is we're gonna increase our cleaning in the common areas and particularly the high touch areas, um, elevator buttons. Um, those, those are one of those things that everybody in the building is gonna touch. So we'll be cleaning those four to five times. Uh, we're, we're giving examples of how you can push a button without a finger and you'd be amazed at how, how many creative ways our staff has come up with uh, how to push an elevator button. Question, will we be taking people's temperature as they come in the building? The answer is no, uh, but we do believe many of our customers will be doing it in their space. Um, in our central business district buildings and many of our um, domain buildings, we have shipping receiving areas, which all of the um, uh, um, packages and deliveries will be required to go through. Um, when they enter those areas, they will be asked to check in with the dock master um, where their temperature will be taken. Um, those are some of the people that we are probably the most concerned about because they're all over town all day long. So we will check their temperature. We will require them to wear a mask on deliveries. Um, question on in the event that we are aware of a positive case in any of our buildings, will we notify our customers? The answer is yes, we already have. Um, in the event it's a vendor or a employee of one of our customers, uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, advise all the, the customers within the building. Uh, we won't identify who it is or the company, but we will make them aware of it. Um, last but not least, uh, we will not be um, providing PP&E to all our customers and all the people entering the building. Um, we, we hope that people will follow these guidelines. Um, and it, again, we, we feel very confident in the, 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 the processes. The, big, the biggest issue is what we don't know and how to react to it. Um, and as we have talked to our teammates, as we roll into this, um, we're going to have questions that we've never even thought of and um, hopefully we'll be in a position to be uh, responsive and uh, help our customers. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it back to y'all, but again, uh, can't wait to see everybody back downtown and at the domain and at the terrace. Thanks so much, Tim. A, a couple things I think I heard you say that are worth noting, one size doesn't fit all. We are going to have to be nimble. Um, 
It is just impossible to over communicate, uh, which as a communicator, that's music to my ear. So I, I applaud what y'all are doing there. Um, and I saw a comment on the chat here that some people couldn't read the signage you put up. If they're looking at this from a mobile device, we will send this out in a blog, including your presentation on Monday. So I don't want anyone to be concerned about that. And before we move on to Rick, we did get a question about something you noted, the, elect the electric sprayers. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, it's a technology that's been, um, most people are calling them boggers. Okay. Um, they, they're, it's a high tech system that will kill the germ. Um, and they've been used widely for many, many years, um, predominantly in industrial settings. But uh, we have found that that's a great tool. Um, so we have literally bought them for every building in our portfolio nationwide. Um, and they, they will be on site. Um, if they're not here already, they'll be here this weekend. Um, okay. and so we'll start cleaning the common areas as well as um, the uh, high touch areas. Okay, thank you. Well, I think all, all the steps that you're putting in place must certainly be alleviating some anxiety for your tenants. You all have been thoughtful about this. Let's move on to Rick. Rick Whiteley again is with Cushman and Wakefield, and he's going to talk to us a little from the perspective of a tenant rep. So Rick, talk to us. If you could unmute. Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, so thank you for the introduction. And thanks to Lynn and Dana, Mariana, and the rest of the chamber staff for the opportunity to be part of this discussion. And thanks to Tim for his great comments there. Uh, for those of y'all who aren't familiar with Cushman and Wakefield, we're a leading global real estate services firm. We've got about 53,000 employees and 400 offices in 60 countries. And we had 2019 revenue of about 8.8 .8 billion from core services uh, such as tenant representation, agency leasing for landlords, uh, as well as property facilities and project management. In Austin, we have about 100 people who are providing all these services. So uh, whoever is controlling the slides, if you could go back to slide one, that would be great. So um, on April 8th, uh, our company leadership announced that our reco recovery re readiness task force had been formed to, to lead the development of best practices, products, and partnerships to prepare clients for post-COVID-19 recovery and the eventual return to the workplace. In addition, we launched a new office design concept called Six Feet Office, which showcases a new social distancing program developed by the firm is currently being tested in our Amsterdam office. The task force is made up of some of our top thought leaders and experts who are drawing on their experience like workplace innovation and strategy, facilities management, commercial cleaning protocols, data and technology, and research. Since its inception, the group has released a publication with step-by-step -step protocols for tenants and landlords to use as they begin planning the transition back to the workplace. This guide, was built on best practices from Cushman and Wakefield's experience in China, where the firm manages 800 million square feet and is already moving 10,000 companies and nearly a million workers back into more than 1,000 buildings. And then it was customized for the US after, based on that experience. So this is the cover of the guide. It's about a 30 page guide. Uh, it addresses many of the pressing questions tenants have regarding how they can be prepared to receive their workforce to prepare their employees to return uh, so the transition is safe, efficient, effective, and aligned to the needs of the organization and the needs of the people. So this guide will be coming out uh, via the Chamber website or a link or something. So uh, we're not going to try to get through all of it today. I'm going to uh, focus on just certain aspects of it. And so these are our six readiness essentials. And so if I could have the second slide, thank you very much. Um, which we're referring to as the safe sex. And this publication will also be made available to the chamber. So first of all, with all the common challenges that both tenants and landlords are facing, it's gonna be a high, high collaboration between landlords and tenants to make all of this successful uh, and, and manage the complexity of the road that lies ahead. And Tim has already touched on many of those different 
collaborations that the, they've already set in motion and many landlords will be doing the same thing. Um, so as we look at the safe six, our first look is preparing the building. And once again, Tim touched on a lot of this that they've already done, uh, but it includes the items like preparing building personnel with appropriate PPE, so they and the tenants are safe, and then training the cleaning staff on, spe on site specific protocols and making any necessary adjustments in the HVAC system for items such as additional fresh air. Second up is as, as the landlords are working to prepare the buildings, uh, the, the tenants uh, can be busy making sure that they're preparing their workforce physically, emotionally, and psychologically. The preparation should be based on a plan to mitigate employees' fears and concerns about their health, job, and the future of the organization. Change management will be cr critical to let employees know what the workforce will look like once they return. And that's really going to be a, a something that everybody needs to work a lot at is that change management. Just there's so much unknowns and, and there will continue to be. So this is going to be an evolving situation. Um, it's already been touched on, but early communication regarding plans that are being made should occur as soon as possible to the workforce. And then also training in advance on a Zoom conference or something else uh, with the employees so that they can learn about the new protocols that are gonna be in place, how the space is going to be modified, and new required patterns of behavior. These are all, once again, essential to the success of, of this returning to the workplace. Uh, these should be supplemented with training after day one and reinforced in the workforce with things like science, like Tip touched on a little bit ago. That's gonna be powerful to remind people in high traffic areas and communicate the messages that, that you want to deliver. Uh, controlling access to the space is going to be critical. Um, just in terms of vendors and deliveries, I'm, I'm sure and Tim may touch on this a little bit, Laughter in the Q&A might be what are going to be limitations on deliveries. Um, reconfiguring the lobby for social distancing, clearly communicating building protocols, providing PPP, hand sanitizer as needed, and then considering temperature screening. I think some employers and tenants will do that, others, others will not. Uh, that's very much going to be an independent decision. Um, next up is create a social distancing plan. So really just doing something as simple as designating the direction of the foot traffic, uh, like most of us have seen in grocery stores and stuff where we have to go down one aisle. So once again, helps in the social distancing, helps everybody knowing which way they need to go. Um, and then consider different days uh, for different job, jobs and people and all of that. That's probably gonna be necessary with most people just to manage uh, as we do stay six feet apart how you manage people coming back in and, and keeping that distancing. Um, and then enforcing stringent cleaning protocols for the employees. I mean, Tim never to be doing janitorial services, lots of landlords, all of that, but just the day-to-day -day keeping the cleaning as well. And then also reduce capacity of spaces such as conference rooms and those types of areas. Uh, next up is reducing the touch point, uh, points and increasing cleaning. So once again, want to maintain enhanced cleaning and disinfecting practices. Um, supply wipes close to the desk and areas. I mean, obviously people are going to want easy access to all of that. If you supply food uh, or snacks or drinks, you're going to have to take a look at lots of single serving, getting away from any of bulk pack product where people might share it. Uh, you want to decrease the amount of shared equipment like copiers, printers, and also high touch items like whiteboard markers, all of that, uh, and then eliminate or strictly limit, and Tim touched on this a little bit that they're asking people to do, uh, in-person meetings coming to the office and then also uh, with personnel who are in the office. And then designating a room for isolation for any person who does, who's showing symptoms so everybody knows where that person should go and that person should go there very quickly if they begin to exhibit those symptoms. Um, then the last is communicating with competence. You know, everybody needs to recognize the fear of the unknown related to returning to work and clearly set employee expectations focused on making everyone feel secure. Um, 
be very transparent, make sure your leadership team is very aligned in reentry and ensure a high level of trust. So with that, I will turn it back over uh, to you, Kristen. Thank y'all. Thank you so much, Rick. And I, I think you said it right off the top, collaboration is key to all of this whether it's between the tenant and the owner, the employer and the employee, because it is all built on trust and we've got to feel good about each other because I think there is a little bit of fear that you talked about. Um, why don't we talk to Pam a little bit now? So I think as people do this, there is some fear and part of that fear relates to liability. There are some legal aspects and this is completely uncharted territory. So again, Pam is with Jackson Walker in the real estate and land use section. So Pam, tell us everything we need to know about the liability aspects of return to office. Thank you very much. And thank you, Chamber, for putting on this important webinar. You know, I, I liked hearing what Tim and Rick and what their companies are doing because they're obviously leaders in the industry and the protocols and the plan that they are putting into place for return to office is right in line with what the Jackson Walker real estate employment and litigation teams are recommending to prepare for uh, this return. What they're doing is going to help not only keep people safe, but should there be another outbreak in their particular office buildings or businesses, it will hopefully allow the businesses to be able to keep working and not have to do a complete shutdown. And then in addition to that, have the added and very important benefit of reducing liability, which is something that I know um, many of us are you know, really concerned about. Uh, we are already starting to see lawsuits filed nationally um, related to exposure to COVID-19. And they've been filed by employees against their employers, either seeking money damages or seeking some type of injunction or relief from the judge uh, to require the employer to provide a safe work environment. On one end of the scale, you have the potential for these really gigantic large class action lawsuits, um, alleging that unsafe workplaces have caused employees to contract COVID-19 or have left, left them at heightened risk uh, of exposure. And then on the other end, you just have these one-off individual lawsuits by an employee um, against his or her employer. Um, on then on a total another spectrum, uh, we have the separate issue of liability related to third parties. Um, as Tim and Rick touched upon, you're going to have customers, vendors, delivery people that visit our businesses. And, um, are they going to be able to bring claims against the businesses that they visit um, or that they deliver you know, goods or services to? And we are already seeing um, and will continue to see for months and, and probably years, um, an incredible number of creative legal theories um, by attorneys who are trying to seek money related to COVID. Um, some of the lawsuits that we've already seen nationally so far are related to failure to properly screen employees for COVID-19, failure to protect employees from other people who have symptoms or even who are asymptomatic, uh, failure to implement a social distancing policy, uh, failure to cleanse a workspace or a business or to properly cleanse it, uh, failure to implement a work from home policy, failure to provide uh, personal protective equipment, PPE, which Tim referred to quite extensively, or failure to implement or follow various uh, guidelines that are emerging, government guidelines. And that's incredibly challenging because you are going to see that these guidelines are changing uh, sometimes daily, sometimes weekly. So it's not enough to look at the rules now and put your plan into place. You're going to have to um, evolve your plan with the evolving regulations. So uh, for example, uh, OSHA, the Occupational Self Safety and Health Administration, like many other governmental agencies has um, posted recommendations. And so OSHA standards include things like providing the uh, personal protective equipment that Tim mentioned, um, and then also what they call the general duty clause, which basically requires employees to provide a place of employment which is free from hazards that can cause death or serious physical harm 
And then they also have requirements related to record keeping and reporting occupational injuries and illnesses. And so it's very important for businesses uh, that right now or up until now have not paid close attention to OSHA, need to really brush up on OSHA recommendations, especially as they relate to COVID. Fortunately, I think that uh, employers are going to have some very good defenses to these lawsuits. Some of these defenses will be state or federal legislation that I believe we're going to see passed in the near future, specific, specifically to address these COVID uh, litigation issues. Um, employers may also have workers' compensation statutes if COVID is a covered occupational disease or injury, which could be helpful as well. Um, as a practical matter, though, I think in many cases, it is going to be very hard for a customer or an employee to prove causation, and that is to prove that they contracted COVID while at your place of business or while at their work, considering that this particular virus you can be exposed to anywhere, whether they're at home, at a store, you name it. So I think that causation portion is going to be very difficult to prove in, um, in these cases. But we do believe that you're going to see uh, quite a few whistleblower cases where people are reporting things that are happening uh, on the construction site, at work, and all of that by you know people who are um, uh, very vigilant or have ulterior motives. So the Americans with Disability Act and recent uh, EEOC guidance addressing COVID return to office issues has provided some uh, good guidance and it basically confirms that an employer can take the following actions under ADA related to COVID. So it is, it is right now written so that it will allow employers to take temperatures of individuals who are entering the workplace, including employees, vendors, customers, guests, so it's quite broad. Um, it allows employers to ask employees if they're experiencing symptoms or have been diagnosed or had potential exposure to COVID. It requires employees to report if they are experiencing symptoms or have been exposed, so an employer can require an employee to report that. Uh, it allows employers to am administer a COVID-19 test to detect the presence of the virus. Um, but obviously employers have to be very careful because they have to uh, take the appropriate steps to ensure that the tests are accurate and reliable. And we are all very familiar with HIPAA and the very robust privacy standards. So you certainly need to keep those in mind. And it allows employers to uh, continue to observe construction, uh, infection control practices in the workplace to uh, prevent transmission and adopt any other screening that is implemented pursuant to advice from the CDC. But the state and federal regulations are changing so rapidly that it really makes things complicated. There are different rules in different jurisdictions uh, and in different states. Uh, so employers really need to be familiar with the Federal Families First Coronavirus Response Act, that's called FFCRA, and then other federal laws mandating employee leave related to COVID, such as the Family and Medical Leave Act. The landscape of employer and employee liability issues is incredibly detailed and complex and it's beyond what we're here to talk about today, obviously. But I think that um, Tim and Rick have really hit home that the best defense to liability for your business or your company is going to be a well-crafted, comprehensive return to office plan that is vigorously followed at your place of business. And, and it will be very helpful for you should you find yourself involved in a lawsuit to be able to show that you had uh, that document and those protocols that were followed. And so I think it's important that we not, uh, we forget that we're not just talking about employer uh, employee issues. Um, plaintiff's attorneys will try to use premises liability legal theories and premises liability is what you see basically in slip and fall cases when someone slips and falls at a business or at a Walmart but they will use those legal th uh, theories to try to get money from businesses related to COVID. So, you know, businesses have customers, delivery people and the like coming into their premises. And you will see claims that, 
you know, a delivery driver came into a business and became sick uh, because of something that business did or did not do. So businesses really need to think about whether it makes sense to post warnings, um, you know, or disclaimers uh, stating that the business takes reasonable steps to clean, uh, but that the customer understands they are coming in at their own risk. Um, so anyway, I'm not providing you legal advice uh, today on any of these issues. It's something that I think it's going to be very important for you to have a qualified employment lawyer or other expert consultant who's really focused in this area provide you with guidance and advice that you're going to need for your particular circumstance because this is so fact-based. Every circumstance is different, but I do recommend that businesses uh, Google the CDC guidance for businesses. It continues to be updated and it has strategies for businesses uh, that really kind of sets forth what they can do and not do that will have the potential for decreasing uh, their liability should a claim you know, be presented or some issue arise. And being able to show that you followed as a business the CDC guidance uh, will make any legal issues that come your way a little easier. Uh, you know, I think it's important, you know, as we've seen with um, the stop, uh, stopping of businesses being able to operate at their offices, we really want to be ready for a future outbreak. We know it's coming at some point, whether it's a month, whether it's six months, whether it's two years. And um, the CDC suggests, and it's obviously great advice, that businesses now go ahead and implement strategies so that they can keep operating um, to protect workers during a future outbreak and don't have to have a full shutdown. So I'm happy to answer uh, any questions in this regard. Thank you so much, Pam. That was really, really helpful. Um, what I heard from you, and I was happy to hear this because I know a number of chamber members are small businesses mm -hmm. that may not have some of the resources we're hearing here. You mentioned the CDC guidelines for businesses. Um, you mentioned OSHA. Would that be another good resource for businesses? Absolutely. Absolutely. But the CDC is really, I believe, the first place to start because it has uh, it has um, information in there that is very broad and covers whether you're a small business or a large business and is really the first steps and it's being uh, updated daily. Excellent. And I see some resources on the screen here. You also mentioned workers' compensation. Texas is an interesting state because it's not required here. I, I know this because I work with Texas Mutual, which is a wonderful chamber member and supporter. And your, your workers comp provider can also be helpful because they should be an expert in safety. I know Texas Mutual is, so I'm glad you brought that up as well. That's, um, why don't, the Texas Workforce Commission is also issuing guidance to, um, to employers regarding unemployment claims for employees that um, either are not coming to work or, um, um, or there's certain issues. So that's a great resource as well. We are getting a ton of questions from our attendees. So I'd like to move to those if that's okay with all of you. Um, we got one question about um, open seating. So this may be a great one for you, um, Tim or Rick, I'll, I'll let you choose. A, a lot of um, companies have gone to more open seating plans. Any advice for those companies? Are masks required for those areas? Can either of you speak to that? Rick, why don't you go ahead? And okay, I'll, I'll take it. So, yeah, I mean, the, the obviously, the more dense you are, the bigger your challenge is in terms of creating the necessary social distancing. So, uh, I mentioned the, the thing that Cushman's done, which is called Six Foot Office, uh, Six Feet Office, pardon me, F E E T. And, and you can go to sixfeetoffice.com to look at that. But these are some, it was a new design protocol that was specifically aimed at doing things quickly and expensively and, and could be worked with the landlord quickly as well that would serve to create that distance. I mean, there's installation of plexiglass barriers in some environments where if you wanted to go that far, if people were literally six feet apart. Um, but I mentioned it earlier and, and that is, I think a lot of people are just going to be looking at doing shift work, if you will, or, or different days for different people in order to create that distance as, as opposed to potentially doing many different improvements. But uh, that, that would be, the, those companies that, that are very dense are gonna face a big challenge. Quite, certainly. Okay, 
shift Kristen, work. That, that could be good. Know, yes. Uh, that's a great question. And one of the things that we've been doing is reaching out and talking to our customers. Um, it's amazing the, the conversations I've had over the last nine weeks. Uh, this is on everybody's mind. You know, we've had this tendency over the last 10 years to become denser and denser and denser and denser. Um, and, and we anticipate that to reverse itself. Uh, how, how much, uh, it's, it's unclear, but uh, it's on everybody's mind. I'm seeing a number of questions here about taking temperatures. You all touched on it. I think maybe we should talk about it a little more. It's a very specific thing to take temperatures or not. Legally, we can. Anybody want to touch on pros, cons? People ask for best practices. I don't know if we have best practices or not. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll start with that. So I do think that um, there's the demand out there and the Chamber, Austin Chamber of Commerce may be interested in doing a follow-up webinar to really go into all of these employer employee issues um, that are so complex related to what can be done at the workplace uh, with respect to workers. Um, you know, whether they're sick or not sick and the like. But um, taking temperatures is allowed, but I think you have to be very careful with how you do that. You know, when you take a temperature, and let's say the temperature comes back at one, 101, and you go ahead and let the employee continue to work, you know, that can be a problem. Um, and so it's, and you also have to worry since the HIPAA rules continue to apply through all of this, you have to be very careful with what you do with that information. That information needs to remain private. And so there are, um, if you're going to take temperature, you need to have a written protocol with what happens if the temperature is normal, what happens if the temperature is not normal, and what are the next steps taken if they're not normal. Thank you, Pam. Um, so we've talked a lot about liability. It's Friday. Maybe we can get a little fun. Uh, someone yeah. named Greg Johnston said, I've heard a few fun ideas. Uh, Pac-Man floor signs, elevator button <laughs> pushing ideas. He thinks Tim and Rick are fun guys. So Tim and Rick, <laughs> what other fun ideas do you have to uh, encourage social distancing and following the rules? And you know, Pam, uh, I think you're fun too. So you, you can chime <laughs> in here. Thanks. Greg's a coworker to cut up. So <laughs> yeah, he's Greg has a cut up. Yeah, you know, um, th this has been stressful for everybody. Um, it is, it's, you know, um, I, I, my history, my life, I've never seen anything like this. I mean, if you'd have told me 10 weeks ago, we would shut down the world economy for nine weeks, I'd tell you, you're crazy. So I, I think it is time for us to, to have some fun. Um, be careful with it. Um, but things like, you know, I can't wait to have a face mask contest. Uh, some of the creative stuff I've seen at the grocery store completely cracks me up. Uh, my wife got me a golden retriever mask. Um, you know, I, I bark, but I don't bite. Uh, so I, I think you know, doing things like that, um, the creative ways to push a button. Uh, again, I've watched some of our team members uh, here in Austin, particularly Heather Haney. Uh, She's got some of the world-class um, button pushing techniques. So yeah, we, we should have some fun with it. Still be serious, uh, but lighten up just a little bit to take, as, as Rick said, this is a stressful uh, time for everybody. You're gonna leave your couch and your webinars and you're gonna go back in and you're gonna start hanging out with your coworkers and uh, trying to do it safely, but have a little fun, I, I think will be important. Thank you for that. Rick, you have anything to add? No, that's Tim. Tim gave some good examples. Greg, you'll have to use Tim. So. I think he outfund you. No, I can't do that. Um, we, we've got some questions here that are, that are a little bit specific to certain companies, and I'd like to keep it general, although we will post some of the questions on the Chamber website after. Um, let me ask this. Um, we talked a little bit about if an employee has a positive COVID test. Mm -hmm. I think I think maybe it was you, Tim, who talked about it. Pam, do you want to talk about it from the legal perspective too? What what is sure. the requirement to tell people while keeping HIPAA in mind? 
Yes, absolutely. So if you have an employee that tests uh, you know, positive for COVID, um, it's going to be very important that you immediately separate uh, you know, the sick or uh, any sick employees. Employees who either appear to have symptoms when they arrive or if they become sick during the uh, workday should immediately be separated and sent home. There should not be a delay in doing that. And uh, businesses need to have a procedure in place for the safe transport of an employee who becomes you know, sick while they're at work. Uh, it may be that they need to be sent home. It may be that they need to be sent to a healthcare provider or you know, a hospital, depending on whatever the circumstances are. Um, in most cases, you do not need to immediately shut down your business. Um, if it's been less than seven days since the sick employee you know, has been in there, then you can close off any areas that were used for a prolonged period of time by that sick person. So for example, if you have a person working at a desk who, who is sick, then you should close off that desk area and not allow other people to use it for the time being. You need to wait, uh, the recommendations are right now that you need to wait at least about 24 hours before cleaning and disinfecting to minimize the potential for other employees that are in that specific area to be exposed to any respiratory droplets uh, that are in the, in the air. Um, if 24 hours isn't feasible, you know, the CDC and, and other regulatory sources have, you know, different uh, guidelines. But the bottom line is basically that you are going to need to follow the CDC cleaning and disinfection uh, recommendations, which are quite specific as to what you need to do. And then really lastly um, will be you need to inform um, the other employees or people in the area of their possible exposure to COVID. But at the same time, you have to maintain the confidentiality that uh, HIPAA and ADA require. So you should not identify the person who has um, become sick. Uh, you should just um, keep that general, but do let them know that there is the potential that they have been um, exposed. So employers basically, um, and you know, there's employees in critical infrastructure businesses as well, and they they also have the obligation to manage, you know, their potentially exposed workers. Okay, thank you. Tim, you said you surveyed a number of your customers. Um, some people are coming back as early as Monday, some as late as September. Are you seeing an average time frame, and is this a voluntary return to work in phases, or is this something that is being required? Uh, we we didn't, Kristen, dive deep into each okay. one of our customers' policies. Um, you know, again, we have law firms, accounting firms, technology firms, and it's it's really all over the board. Um, but I do think over the next thirty days, we'll start developing a trend line. Um, mm -hmm. But right now, we just don't have that detail of information. Mm -hmm. Got it. I, I've got one follow-up question for you, Pam, about quarantining exposed staff. Mm -hmm. Is that something that employers are required to do for, I think it's 14 days? Have them yes. work from home? Yes. If, if an employer um, knows that um, they have an employee with either COVID or that is potentially exposed to COVID, they need to advise that employee that they need to quarantine for 14 days. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, some more questions on cleaning and um, specifically the HVAC system. Um, Tim, Rick, would either of you like to go into any more specifics about the HVAC system? Do you have any more to offer on that? Rick? Tim, go ahead. Yeah, uh, you know, air quality and ventilation is, 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 is uh, you're talking about four or 500,000 square foot tires is, is uh, critical. So, uh, you know, the steps we're taking is proactively replacing the air filters which over the last nine weeks we've been doing, um, you know, ensuring that we have the maximum airflow ratings in accordance with our HVAC equipment, uh, disinfecting the air handlers, interiors, the coils um, on a regular uh, basis, um, the outside air, uh, continuously monitor our outside air ventilation and make sure we're getting the maximum levels uh, per our equipment uh, specs. 
and we we continue to also look at new technology. I do believe, um, as uh, Rick and Pam have, have stated, um, we're we're at the beginning of this. Uh, we're going to learn a lot over the next ninety to hundred days. Um, there will be new technology that comes out of this. Um, we haven't seen it yet. Um, a lot of it's been tested. Um, Data is being developed. Um, so I do think we will evolve. Um, how fast that actually happens, I'm, I'm not sure. But that's what we're doing as far as our HVAC systems. And then as far as cleaning, are there any best practices that you've seen? And again, this is all evolving for cleaning high touch items and surfaces. Is it once a day? Is it multiple times a day? Does it depend on the space? I yeah, think you're going to have to do some of it multiple times a day. I mean, if you have shared equipment and some of those shared tools like we talked about, I mean, those are almost going to have to be wiped down almost every time. I mean, so that's why decreasing the use of those is going to be helpful just in terms of people not having to continually wipe it down. But I think that's going to be a big part of making everybody feel safe and secure is just doing a lot of follow up, both the landlord in the common areas as well as the tenants within their spaces and having a very much aware of that, having those an easy access for your employees so that you can just pull it and wipe it down right then and there. And I mean, particularly, you know, back on the density question, it's, I mean, people in some cases are sharing desks. So, I mean, coming up with a policy to have temporary placemats, those kind of things on the desk so that those that are paper that can be thrown away literally after every use are other ways that people are gonna probably try to deal with it. That's a good idea. Well, we're coming up on the hour mark here. Before we close, I'd like to give our panelists one more opportunity to share any parting words or thoughts, and I'll go in the order that we started. Tim, anything else you'd like to share with our uh, attendees today? Yeah, uh, first of all, it's it's great to to be able to participate and, and share what what knowledge we have with the rest of our business community. Uh, special thanks to, to Kristen and really out, everybody at the chamber for putting this together. Um, you know, don't be scared. Um, you know, we're all in this together. Work with your uh, the ownerships of your buildings. Don't forget to ask questions. There are no dumb questions. Uh, you know, some of them are pretty comical. Um, some are very serious. But uh, make sure that you're communicating not only with the ownership of the assets, but also sharing the information with your employees. Um, and uh, now we'll get through this and uh, we'll be welcoming y'all back very, very soon, I hope. Okay, thank you, Tim. Rick? Yeah, so once again, thanks to the Chamber staff for putting this together and all the other panelists, it's, it's been great. Um, I would encourage everybody to re reach out to their real estate professional for help in this area. I mean, Cushman, We've talked a lot about what we've done. Certainly a lot of the other big firms have done similar things. I think we were first out, but others have followed. Uh, but reach out, everybody should be a resource. I mean, you can think of Cushman as a resource. You can call me. I mean, there's there's a lot of, of us in the marketplace, so I don't hesitate to reach out to, to your Cushman person or someone else, uh, but, but definitely get them on your team, get them on board. They're gonna be able to offer hopefully best practices and help you kind of steer through this. And then if there's even more extensive services of, you know, in terms of completely redesigning the workplace to get social distancing, all of that, um, there's going to be those types of services available as well. So definitely treat us as a resource and as often as you need to. Thank you so much. Pam? The number one thing I would do if I was a small business or a big business would be read the CDC guidelines. They're uh, relatively easy to read. They're um, robust. And, and that is... Um, if you don't have the resources to consult an expert in that area, that is absolutely where I would go to, um, you know, try to get a handle on things. But this is not something that I would wing. I mean, it's really important and you do need to seek out advice if it's, from, if it's not through an expert from mentors and, you know, other people in your specific industry. And I'd also like to say I really appreciate everything that the Austin Chamber has done. Um, locally here in Austin and Travis County and statewide working on the um, you know back to office um, orders and opening up um, our community and the economy in a safe way so I really appreciate the Chamber's efforts in that regard. 
Thank you, Pam. I second that. And I would be remiss if I didn't speak for my area of expertise, which is communications. Elizabeth Christian PR has been doing business here for 25 years. And I would say your brand is as your brand does. So I think the way companies handle this transition is going to make a big difference in how they come out of this. Your employees are your brand ambassadors and the level of confidence and comfort they feel in coming back will, will make a big difference in how they represent your company. And the months and years to come. Um, and don't wing it, ask for help. Go to, go to the experts like the folks on this panel or my firm or the chamber. There are a lot of people who are here to help. So thanks to our panelists today. Thanks to the chamber partners who make this kind of programming possible. If you're an attendee today and not a member, I encourage you to join. This is the kind of resource you get as a chamber member. This is recorded and it will be sent out on Monday as a blog post along with all of the resources that were shared today. Um, we'll have some other tips. So uh, stay tuned for that on Monday. And in the meantime, stay safe. Uh, let us know what you're doing to help others return to the office safely. And have a great weekend, everybody.